second speaker today is Dr. Nishi Singh. She's a professional at the hot seat of the pandemic affecting humanity today. Dr. Nishi, a medical microbiologist and virologist, is currently working as a consultant at Conceive Gynecology and Fertility Hospital and as an adjunct professor of virology and infectious disease at the College of Medicine, Khalifa University and also is a PhD supervisor at Mahe Manipal University. She is on the scientific board of UAE Genetic Disease Association and editorial teams of scientific journals for research and medical education. She is a published author of scientific research papers and speaker at regional and international meetings, a national talent scholar. Her medical journey started as the best outgoing graduate gold medalist from Lady Harding Medical College of Delhi University, where she was also awarded with President's Gold Medal for Best MBBS Student. She did her uh, MS Virology from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine with distinction, and she did her MD from Ames. An MRC Path and FRC Path Virology from Royal College of Pathologists, London, she trained at Royal Free Hospital and St. Thomas Hospitals, London. Dr. Nishi is a fellow of the International Medical Science Academy for her exemplary contribution to medical sciences. Her other positions have been the head of microbiology and infection control at Dubai Hospital, head of pathology and infection control, Rashid Hospital, a senior lecturer, Dubai Medical College for Girls, and Academic Chair, Lab Medicine, Sharjah Women's College. She was awarded with the Dubai Government Excellence Award 2000 and also got an award for commitment to patients at Rashid Hospital in 2003. In fact, Dr. Nishi has been awarded with three excellence awards by the government of UAE. And I just found out a few minutes before that she's also a wonderful poet, poetess and does poetry on uh, medical uh, field. She has been actively involved in social work at the Indian Consulate and has also conducted awareness programs for laborers during COVID times. Uh, welcome Dr. Nishi, nice knowing you. Please quench our thirst for knowledge with your valuable inputs on today's topic. Thank you Dr. Deepak for the kind introduction. Uh, with the limited time that's available to me, I think I will not uh, waste time on talking about myself, but just in one line that for me, it has been a jump from internal medicine to uh, pathology, to microbiology, to virology and advanced immunology and molecular biology. Because, you know, if you're a stu lifelong student, then you're always looking for answers. And I think as the world has seen, you know, like, 35 years ago when I moved, people said virology? I mean, what the hell is virology? And what, the, what, what do you really actually do? Remember, this was the time when HIV was just uh, isolated. This was 84, 85, 86. And I think the last 15 months has really uh, made us very, very aware of the work we do. So without further ado, I will uh, jump into it and I'll try and keep to the time. Uh, so remember, uh, thank you, Dr. Patil, for taking care of the clinical signs and symptoms and treatment that really makes my life easy. And I have learned so much about your complementary medicine. I also want to say that this is the first time I'm speaking to any uh, medical professional groups, uh, starting from the senior most specialists to the junior most students and laypersons. This is the first time I speak in a forum where I'm talking to practitioners of complementary medicine. So your talk has been very enlightening for me and I wish, I really think that this is the way forward. We really have to bring in every possible remedy. Okay, so what I wish to do in the next few minutes, and I will need to jump a lot of slides up and I'll look for the question answers because otherwise if I go into too many details, you're going to miss the, the bus of the important things. So really, uh, I'm a molecular biology person. That's how I introduce myself. So really, we need to go down to the molecules that constitute the virus and what havoc they play at the molecular level uh, in the human body. 
And thank you for covering a lot of pathological parts so I can skip that. Uh, what is also very important is not just the immune response, but the way we are diagnosing the virus. Because remember, 70 to 80 percent of the clinical decisions are based on the laboratory tests. So it is very crucial that one understands, any practitioner understands what the value of these tests is. Uh, uh, and also the, not just the specific test for the viruses, but also the biomarkers, some of which you alluded to in your talk, Dr. Patel. Um, vaccination, I think we will talk about it and there'll be many more questions and answers because the way the current knowledge stands, uh, I think newspapers are full of vaccination details. So any person with uh, even a modicum of uh, medical lingo and language will understand what is going on with vaccination. I think we've been bombarded with so much information that I will try and limit myself to things that are not in the realm of the, uh, of the public because a lot of things have moved into uh, social media platforms and general public. I will only talk about what is published evidence and try and share with you some of the studies because I think that's what we as medical professionals from whichever branch of medicine we may be, we need to be literally basing our clinical judgments and treatment of the patients based on published evidence and not hearsay in the uh, available in the media. So it just happened that uh, last year, early on in February and March, I was teaching a course of virology and infectious diseases at Khalifa University. And these were to the first batch of MD students in the UAE. So uh, happened to, the first case was admitted at the SKMC hospital. And this was a gentleman who had returned from Wuhan. So, you know, I took special permissions and then took bedside teaching rounds. And of course we followed the, uh, uh, at that time, it was the uh, the novel coronavirus case assessment algorithm that was given to us by the ministry. And uh, all of us who are practicing in the Middle East know that we have to follow the guidelines to the T, otherwise there can be big trouble. Uh, so we then ran the RT-PCR at that point and the whole, it had to be run as a respiratory disease pneumonia panel and a coronavirus was detected. Now 15 sorry, months- sorry. Can I just interrupt, Dr. Nishi? Yes. Can you change? Can you change your setting to full screen because I we are do. seeing you? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll do. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, oh, so our, thank you for pointing out, Dr. Vinita, and of course, thanks to Dr. Vinita that I'm part of this uh, speaker panel today. So, fast forward to 15, 16 months down the line, and the newspapers are filled of so much. Uh, unconfirmed, unpublished data that one is really bewildered. So the mystery still remains as far as, and like uh, Dr. Patel pointed out very eloquently that we've been using all possible modalities of treatment because the way the virus is behaving in the first wave to second wave and uh, God forbid the third, we are really worried about how the virus is uh, you know, behaving itself not just in the clinical samples in human body, but also in the environment. So I think everything becomes really important for us to move forward. So are we really in a situation we are, where we are blind Melvin? Well, certainly not in this group, but to the lay person still, because they're so bewildered by the changing, uh, the way the virus is changing in not just the human body, but in the environment as well. So hopefully by the end of the presentation, we'll be a little better off. Uh, well, what, where are we at the moment? Well, we know, and I just want to emphasize a bit of the virology here, because remember, it is a positive stranded RNA virus with a genome of about 30,000 beta coronavirus family. Remember, it has about 79 to 50% homology with the other two viruses that we encountered in 2013 and uh, 2003 and four, when I was still at Rajshad Hospital. And we handled and we expected that this would behave exactly like the others did. Few thousand cases, few hundred deaths, and we would be rid of it. What has changed with, from this virus to the, uh, from the previous virus, coronaviruses that we've had problems in the human population to present is the way it has the pathogenicity and transmissibility has literally hit the roof. And we all know that they came from uh, animals. And I've just shared a picture of the pangolin here because not many people have seen the pictures of pangolin. Okay, so uh, the emphasis in every 
paper or newspaper or social media is about spike protein, spike protein, and spike protein. What really I want to share here is that it's not just the spike protein that constitutes this little bunch of molecules called the coronavirus. We have the RNA inside, but there are three more proteins that are important for pathogenicity as well as the way the virus behaves in the cells. So we should be looking at all of them and not just the spike protein. Now, uh, uh, please pardon the quality of these slides, but these were from a recent meeting at the International Society of Infectious Diseases. And I really want to share this unpublished information in this platform. Uh, remember, we are not just looking at all these proteins that have different distinct functions and the virus cannot function without each one of them. Uh, remember, what is also important is that between the previous viruses and this, that it has a unique furin cleavage site. And that is why it has become so pathogenetic, unlike the others. And this is present in the S1, S2 site. And these are X-ray crystallographic structures of the uh, virus spike protein. And we know how it is spread. So the transmissibility really gives that huge advantage to the virus. I also want to tell you that here that the air distance is important because initially in the pandemic, it was thought that it was the droplet infection. Therefore, the social distancing measures um, had, uh, you know, the guideline was that six feet and to one meter distance because we thought it was the bigger droplets. But what is now clearly proved that it is the smaller droplets, less than five micron in sign, which uh, in size quite like the tuberculosis scenario where they remain suspended in air, Therefore, large gatherings, indoor gatherings with poor ventilated environments is where transmission is occurring. So coming back to the, uh, the virus, uh, please don't, uh, don't get uh, daunted by the viral transmission cycles. We know that it's respiratory root. We know, as Dr. Patel also said, it binds to the ACE2 receptors. Remember, the virus fuses with the cell membrane the genome is released and then it, the viral assembly is complete and the replication happens and everything then leads to the virus budding from the membrane of the cell. Now, we know that it was ACE, we know for sure that it's ACE2 receptors because soluble ACE2 receptors in laboratory studies has blocked the entry of the virus through the membrane. Yeah. So, I would skip the things about the uh, signs and symptoms. Remember, we now come down to the immune response. Now, once the antigen presenting cell and mainly the macrophages in our tissues encounter the virus, the way the virus is presented to the T and the, the T and the B cell is through different major histocompatibility conflicts. Now, some of you may know these as the uh, HLA, uh, molecules. Remember the HLA typing? It is really, which is now re-designated uh, as the MHC class 1 and class 2. So the way the your own genetics presents the viral proteins to your uh, two arms of the immune system is the way your immune response is there in the person. That's why we see this entire spectrum of infections from mild asymptomatic to all the way to the severe infections. Because once the virus has been presented to two different arms, it is completely different group of cytokines that I would say kickstart the whole process. So really it is the cytokines that determine how the patient is going to be presenting clinically. So. Now, the inflammation can both be anti-inflammatory, which is the good one. We need inflammation to get rid of the infection. But we also are very wary of the, uh, the un unhealthy inflammatory process, which is what is causing maximum damage in human bodies. So it is, uh, Dr. Patel had introduced the term cytokine storm. Some people, and it is really the genetics of an individual where you kick up the cytokine storm, secreting or releasing these very unhappy set of cytokines that cause all the tissue damage and all the problems in different parts of the body. 
So it is not just limited to the virus uh, attaching to the receptors, it is really the trigger and the antigen presentation that causes issues in the human body. So really we are now, I mean, as molecular biologists and virologists, the aim is directed to search for the immune response that can stop the infection. Now just, uh, I'll take a stop here to say that, remember it is the cyto T cell response, which is important in getting rid of all the infected cells. The antibodies only can prevent infection. They have no role in recovery from infection. So that is very important for all medical practitioners to understand. Now, uh, I also, again, I'm sharing the same slides from the International Society of Infectious Disease Lectures uh, in um, in the last few weeks, where there are researchers working on immunoprofiling projects, because we don't have answers from the way the patients are behaving. So what is really important now is the immunophenotyping that is important in understanding. And I'll quickly run through just these pictures for you to understand that it's not just the typing of the S protein, but looking for specific epitopes. You see, patients or uh, practitioners tend to think that there is one protein and one antibody. It is not like that. Antibodies are such huge molecules that it's only specific areas which have specific antibodies. So it is not like all or none phenomena that I have an S, anti S antibody, therefore I should not get the infection. I have to have very finely tuned immune response which will direct it to the epitopes that bind to the receptors where I need to have those kind of antibodies to be able. And these epitopes are now being localized for you to understand that one antibody is not enough for this huge protein. We need antibodies to the ACE2 receptor binding region to be able to prevent infection. That's why when I come to vaccination, I'll allude to this. And these are just pictures for you to understand that there is a lot of work going on to, under, uh, to identify these sites. So we really need epitope specific antibodies because these are the ones that will correlate to neutralization, not just antibodies that are being measured randomly by various labs and various reagent makers in the, in the market, in the commercial market. Uh, even the pattern of cytokines, and this is just as a glance, at a glance to show you from healthy controls to all the way to the patients with hypoxia, how different is the immune profile of these patients. So, and, and even after recovery, I mean, Dr. Patel alluded to post-COVID syndrome, you can see how the cytokines change over the period of say six months that these patients have been studied by these particular researchers. In, you can see at a glance how the molecular phenotypes are completely different. So as evidence-based medicine and you know, as followers of evidence-based medicine and as follow, and uh, people who have this thirst for knowledge, you must realize that it is really at the molecular level what is going on. So even the transcriptomes uh, are different and, diff and change with disease severity. So what is happening to the virus? Back to the virus. We know and everybody talks about the mutants. We, uh, now deletions in certain parts of these proteins have been identified. And uh, I just want to say, share here that how WHO has changed the entire nomenclature because you know countries like ours, uh, when I say ours, I mean India, objected to everybody talking about I mean, why was the first variant not called UK variant? We, some people did, but then there are cultural sensitivities to these things. So to be more scientific, it is simpler to just refer to them by their Latin uh, names or Greek, sorry, did I say, yeah, Greek surname. Now, I just want to show you that what has happened because of this change in the molecular phenotype of the virus is that in, uh, the, uh, the second wave or you know, the second wave that is happening, there is definitely reduced systemic inflammation in majority of patients. So more people are getting milder disease and moderate disease because it is related to the cytokine change in the virus and therefore change in the immune response 
and therefore change in the clinical severity. Now, if you look at the populations, everybody talks about TNB cells, but even the other panels, the neutrophils, the granulocytes, all have a different profile in uh, you know, healthy people compared to the acute and the recovered patients. So it is not just depending on the virus test, it is also the general blood picture that will help you in determining the severity of infection. So in acute patients, they have a completely different profile. Uh, recovered in acute patient, uh, sorry, uh, some disturbance. Uh, remember the, the other cells also change according to different severity. So jumping to the lab tests, everybody knows that seven, you know, majority of our clinical decisions are based on the uh, COV-2 diagnosis and we have multiple approaches not just virological, but also uh, imaging studies are important. In the uh, laboratory tests also, we have a whole range and I'll try and cover most of them in the short time provided. Remember for any lab test, how you take the sample is very important. How you transport the sample is very important. So please, if any one of you are assisting uh, in sample collection or taking it yourself, please make sure that it's a nasopharyngeal sample because viruses don't grow in the nose except for the rhinoviruses. Most of them localize in the nasopharynx. So we really have to take the right, take sample, the right sample and uh, send and send it for the test. So we know that we have a range of tests available to us. We know that the antibodies are different and you know the sample has to be taken at the right time. So I will talk about that. And really the antibody tests don't seem to have much role in early diagnosis of infection. Now, being a virologist, I love to share these pictures because to me, I mean, this is wonderful pictures. You can see that uh, uh, in the electron micrograph, how beautifully the virus is scanned in the uh, electron micrographs. Remember, it's a very laborious procedure, but if we don't have the virus, we cannot pro uh, progress forward in either in making vaccine the vaccine or nor in the diagnostic test. So viral culture is really the mainstay before we start any process. Uh, just a word that we need uh, BSL-3 containment. And as today I heard from the Wuhan lab that uh, the lady uh, who isolated the virus was working in BSL-2. So I don't know how much credibility that gives to the conspiracy theories, but we can leave that for question and answer later. Okay. so. To me, the best test is to detect the viral antigen and it is very inexpensive. We can use it for widespread studies. It is almost like doing a pregnancy test with the line immunoassays. And the important thing is this, that even though the limit of detection is 100 to 1000 times higher, we our goal is to identify the, those transmitting the virus because in public health, that is important. I don't want to know the PCR result six weeks after the patient is recovered because I have personally seen patients positive with PCR up to eight weeks. Now, why are we doing such an expensive test for which, which has no clinical meet, meaning? And also that this virus is not infectious. So what are we gaining by doing such an important uh, expensive test? Of course, we have limitations like we do for every test, but we have to see what is the clinical relevance more than uh, the academic purpose? So, of course, we know that, especially since uh, COVID came into being uh, since last year, everybody has become an expert on RT-PCR. So I don't want to go into the principle of the test, but happy to answer if anybody wants to know. Very high sensitivity and specificity. Well, if you compare to the line immunoassays, this is long. I mean... Pregnancy test takes five minutes or 10 minutes. We need uh, expensive instrumentation. So it is not possible in the field uh, setting where people are not trained in molecular biology. And of course, price remains a factor for widespread usage. So in PCR, remember we are looking for the viral pieces of viral gene. Now, the three areas that we look for are these three genes. Remember the nucleocapsid and the envelope. Uh, E-gene is also there and a big open reading frame where which covers the spike protein. Now, the positive result is only given out, of course, when at least two of the three are positive. And this is how we interpret in the uh, 
lab. Now, some of you may have seen the reports where they say the test is inconclusive. That means only one is positive. So we then ask the patients uh, to repeat the test after 24 hours or 48 hours. Now, PCR is not a gold standard. And I want to highlight this, that both the sensitivity and the specificity is nowhere near 100 because there are factors that are related to the virus. And of course, the mutations in the virus will change the sequence and therefore the primers in the lab will not bind to the virus. Uh, the way we collect the sample is important. And of course, the viral load, how much virus the patient sample has before we can actually uh, ident identify it. The, uh, the, you know, in the layperson's uh, realm also, yeah. apart from the medical profession, all patients have become virologists. Sorry, a lot of echo and uh, disturbance. Okay. Uh, even in the patient realm, people know this uh, business of cycle threshold. Basically, cycle threshold is the level of detection after which we, uh, we will say, uh, the patient is positive or the sample is positive. But remember cycle threshold, if the virus takes too much, too many cycles of multiplication uh, in the lab to become positive, that means the viral load in the sample was very low. So I, I, uh, friends in India shared this ICMR circular where we took the cutoff as 35. Remember when interpreting a PCR, we have all false positive and false negative results. So please be wary of not taking it as a gold standard. I want to share this meta-analysis. Remember, it was done to show that the first few days of the sample is when we, of the symptoms is when the virus becomes positive. So even though the shedding may continue for more than two weeks, up to eight weeks that I have seen, the virus can be Live virus cannot be detected after nine days. So please disregard any, uh, uh, any report after nine days. Detection of uh, antibodies is another important one. Remember, uh, we, it is mainly for detection of past infection. There are lots of false positive and false negative like in any other test. And the important thing here is that I'm being bombarded with antibody tests being done in the community. The thing is, when, why do we do a test? We need answers as physicians. So if the, if the test doesn't give me an answer to say if I'm negative, it does not mean that you have not been in contact. It is no evidence of protection. Even if I'm positive, there is no answer that I get what stage of illness you are in, except that you've recovered or you have been exposed. So why are we doing a test which really gives us no answers as practitioners of medicine? Remember, so I do not advocate for anyone doing, at least any patient with symptoms doing uh, antibody test. It is not for infection diagnosis. And even if general people are doing it or, you know, just normal people are doing it, it is not a means of uh, issuing an immunity passport. So why are we doing the test in the first place? The only place where it has any rule is for disease tracking, maybe lower risk of infection, but that's a big question mark. When plasma be was being used for treatment, it could identify plasma, but of course all uh, meta-analyses have shown that plasma has no role in treatment of patients. And of course, it can use when it can be used where PCR or antigen tests are not uh, available. We can use it for studying vaccine efficacy studies, but then most of us are individual practitioners. We are not working for public health or vaccination studies. So really, we would depend on PCR tests for patients and antigen tests, and can you know carry on with the. Uh, identification and treatment as Dr. Patel is very well, has elucidated very well. Despite we know, despite knowing so much, the pandemic is continuing and there is no corner of the world from where the cases have not been reported. What is driving this community transmission is the asymptomatic infection. And this is what I need to, I need to spend or at least make you aware of these studies that are being done that Viral loads in asymptomatic patients were found to be significantly higher. 
viral load has a negative trend with increasing age. So in older patients, they have less virus. And as the disease severity increases, you would think that the viral load would increase, but it's actually the opposite. There is significant decrease in viral load with increasing uh, increased disease severity because it is really the cytokines and the inflammatory response that is driving the disease, not the infection. So please be aware, uh, aware of this. And of course, and the asymptomatic patients have the highest viral load. So you've actually transmitted the virus even before you have come down with the disease. You know, when we were wearing all these uh, astronaut-like suits and very extensive PPE, personal protection measures in dealing with the patients, we forgot that it's really the, uh, the visitors, the family contacts who we were giving the answers to outside in the corridors who were spreading the virus. And this is what is driving this pandemic. So in asymptomatic patients, if you are screening for contacts of the patient, please remember to include the antigen tests because these are the ones that will pick up the contacts and the infectious contacts, if I may say so. So uh, the, even the immunoprofiling uh, has been done by this group in Singapore of asymptomatic COVID patients because those are the ones that are creating public health havoc, if I, would, if I may say so. So see, the, the immunoprofile of a symptomatic patient is completely different from asymptomatic. Now, unfortunately, we don't have these kind of tests available to be done here, the transcriptome studies. We need advanced genetic labs to be able to do that. But at least as practitioners, we should be aware of the role of asymptomatic patients. Now, I alluded to the biomarkers in the beginning. Uh, remember, they have a role because even with the complete blood count, if you don't have uh, access to a virology or an advanced lab, even the general neutrophile lymphocyte ratio, complete blood counts can also give you a lot of indication about the uh, severity of the disease and the prognosis of the patient. Remember, thrombocytopenia is also related to higher myocardial damage. And all these uh, horror stories of patients dropping dead uh, are related to the way the virus is behaving or the, the immune response is behaving. So remember the lymphopenia, these are the important cells for immune response, but in patients of severe COVID, the lymphocyte count drops dramatically. And this is not just because of the cytopathic effect of the virus, but it also triggers off apoptosis, which is like cell suicide. Um, the IL-1 is one important one driving fever. And I'm so glad uh, Dr. Patel talked about fever because fever is a generalized systemic inflammatory response. It actually helps the patient. So this business of running for paracetamols is not a great idea. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for that. I, I tell patients that we should be always looking at fever as a friend and not as a foe. Of course, hypopyrexia, when it starts interfering with cell function and organ functions, is that's when we need to step in as physicians. Okay, so general laboratory tests, of course, uh, we have a lot of the series of tests. So if you don't have access to viral specific tests, please do base your clinical judgments on uh, the levels of CRP. CRP is a very important marker, ferritin, D-dimer, procalcitonin, and the whole list of uh, tests. The immunological markers really are, uh, help us. So the value of all these cytokines listed here can really help you in prognosis of the patient. Now, uh, again, post-COVID syndrome has become a very important issue now. We are seeing increasingly issues in patients who, have, who were successfully discharged and then 10 days later dropped dead or went into, um, you know, Dr. Patil mentioned about seizures. So really, what is happening in these patients? What is known for COVID is that it clamps down an early innate immune response and the immune response, either it goes haywire completely or it also then clamps down the later adaptive response. So the fine tuning of the immune response is not happening in patients of COVID and therefore autoantibodies and autoimmune diseases are creating a lot of problems. So just not respiratory issues, 
but cardiovascular problems, renal, dermatologic, all kinds of rashes I'm seeing in patients. Neurologic symptoms, seizures that uh, Dr. Patel spoke about, autoimmune phenomenon. I have seen cases who have developed myasthenia gravis, who have developed autoimmune uh, anterior uveitis. And I spoke to the ophthalmologist and they said, yes, we are seeing this and we are wondering why, what is happening in these patients. So even not just post COVID, but also post COVID vaccination. Psychiatric concerns uh, are of paramount importance. And really one has to be aware of post COVID complications that are being presented, not just after four weeks, but even for months after the patients have recovered. In fact, the patients of anterior uveitis and my senior gravis that I've seen are like six months after recovery. So please, and of course there are clinical syndromes, the multi multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children and now adults, which are very well known now. So what do we do for these patients? Remember for diagnosis, we don't have any virus specific tests that can help us. It is only, the uh, you know the whole syndrome of the or the whole collection of tests that we can do to see whether it is related to COVID or just uh, randomly arising in the population. The guidelines uh, from CDC and the uh, say that we should not be using these to predict patients because there are no studies to help us in that. So and also I want to say that over the counter vitamins and supplements we don't know because uh, unlike some, I think one gentleman said that he's a researcher in homeopath, a lot of these things are just coming from the WhatsApp university. And I, I'm sure all of you have encountered how much damage the WhatsApp university is doing to uh, general people, patients and treatment modalities. So please be aware of that. We know the whole list of uh, patients who are at risk of COVID, at risk of severe COVID, and unfortunately at risk of post COVID related complications. So it's really quite similar to what we have seen in COVID patients. So uh, if I have a little time, I will talk about vaccination, but if you're running out of time, we can give it a miss. I would need maybe five, seven minutes more. Please continue, please continue. Thank you so much. Uh, what about vaccination? Well, uh, we know that the Delta variant is now taking over the world. And this was from a press conference that Dr. Fauci gave. Of yeah. uh, we know the Delta variant is now threatening to take over the rest of the world as well. So we have to be worried about any vaccine that we use should cover these. And of course, it is characterized by greater transmittability to the previous wild type variant. It is hitting younger people. So there is a powerful argument for going for vaccination. So we know that the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccines protect against the Delta variant, almost 88% and 50% efficacy. We know that we have to take the second shot, shot or second dose of the vaccine because the first dose alone is only 33% effective. Uh, please make sure, I mean, this was of course a press conference. So please, there is a case for vaccination and taking both the two uh, doses. And as we speak, uh, I also got from the UAE government uh, this uh, notification to say they've also now allowed the second boost, uh, the booster shots of Sinopharm. So please, if you've taken both the first doses, go ahead and take your second dose six months after the primary immunization. We know that all these vaccines are available and we know what they do and how they are made. So I will skip this because everyone is aware of what kind of vaccines we are using. This is, the, this is just to show where each vaccine is being used in the world. And uh, Covaxin, I think, finds a place here. The others are mainly AstraZeneca is the predominant one, despite a lot of fear about the thromboembolic complications that occurred following the uptake of AstraZeneca. But still, it's uh, and we haven't seen that many cases that it is a case for uh, withdrawing the vaccine. So Covaxin has done very well as well. And I, uh, you know, I, my own MD batchmate is the uh, director of the National Institute of Virology, Pune. So 
you know, I get a lot of information from her because the Covaxin was based on the first vaccines, uh, first virus isolates from the NIV Pune. So I'm sure the Indian practitioners will be very proud. So are we uh, practicing elsewhere in the world? Remember the T cell is very important for uh, recovery from infection. So none of the only, I think Pfizer studies have come out to say that they have good memory T cells, which will be important from, uh, for recovery, but it is really the antibodies that we are worried uh, or have been studied in detail. And these antibodies, antiviral antibodies are not declining for up to four months. And now they, we are saying six to nine months. So really, do we have neutralizing antibodies? Again, we are, this is being studied in detail. Now, even neutralizing antibodies from previous infections are associated with infection, with reinfection, even though cases of reinfection have been reported in people who have had previous uh, recoveries. But it's very important to understand that these may be post-COVID complication not, and not just reinfection. So please be aware when whichever modality of treatment you're going to give to these patients. Uh, the immune response following vaccination is uh, primary and then secondary. So there is a case for boosters at about six months to be able to get a good uh, protection. I also want to say here that the protection does not mean that you will not get infection. The protection and the efficacy studies are only for preventing severe disease and hospitalization. So when we talk about 5% or 95% or 60% or 70% efficacy, remember there are still 5% uh, people who are prone to getting infection, even with the best efficacy of the vaccine. So I have WhatsApp. Ka. Okay. Uh, so where was I? So yeah, yeah, yeah. The 5 to... 30% of the people with any vaccine that you may have taken or given will be uh, will may have the risk of getting the infection and asymptomatic infection is giving higher uh, viral shedding. So please be aware of that. So as we talk, the biggest vaccination campaign in the history of the world is underway. More than 2 billion doses have been given across 180 countries and UK reported first time no death in COVID patients, which is very encouraging. So I would really uh, urge all of you to advocate vaccination. I'm not going to talk about the side effects. We will deal with them when you, when you have specific questions. So uh, remember the vaccine itself will cause prevent or help you in preventing severe disease and uh, hospitalization. Remember, even people who have got the uh, COVID infection and have recovered should get vaccinated. And the uh, recent studies are saying uh, three to four months later is fine. COVID vaccines cannot give you COVID-19 because none of the vaccines in the market contain live attenuated virus. So please uh, emphasize that to your patients. And of course, COVID vaccines do not give rise to a positive PCR test. And I've been asked this question so often that I've included these in my slides. And this is from the CDC, of course, because vaccine hesitancy can cost us many lives. So we really need to firmly uh, make sure that all our patient populations or populations that we are dealing with should go ahead and get the vaccine. Uh, just one slide on pregnancy and COVID, and I will answer many, uh, any questions that you may have. The disease is definitely more severe. Placental infection has been confirmed in pathological slides with infection, viral antigens and virals detected in this in situ trophoblast. Therefore, cases of vertical transmission, mother to baby transmission have been reported. Uh, there are distinct cases of stillbirth being reported. And I think that last study was from Ireland. So please, uh, all clinicians dealing with pregnant women do consider, remember pregnancy itself is a hypercoagulable state. So there is a definite case for low molecular weight heparin in patients who then get COVID infection. So just a word about monoclonal antibodies because they are very much in news at the moment. Uh, monoclonal antibodies are not vaccines. They only have role in treatment of mild to moderate COVID 
the FDA has given emergency use authorization. Uh, trials are undergo are underway for prevention as well as for post exposure prophylaxis of uh, close contacts of the patients, and it is really antibody therapy, which is just a passive antibody therapy, passive immune therapy, not vaccine where we are dealing with active uh, immune responses. So please, again, because monoclonal antibodies are in the news so much, so be aware of these. Remember, vaccines are exclusively preventative, while monoclonal antibodies are for treatment, and we are still awaiting studies for post-exposure prophylaxis in COVID contacts. So what is going to happen now? Well, we don't know. And I am one of those optimists who will hope that there is no th third wave. But going by the experience of the uh, 1918 pandemic, where we had a small one and then a very high one in uh, 1919, and then 1920 winter, there was a very small peak of the previous pandemic that the humankind or documented history talks about. So because the dispersion factor of the SARS-CoV-2 is much less than uh, flu, we hope we will not see what happened with the previous flu virus. So uh, I think as doctors, we all like to have this target chart. Yeah, so I think doc I saw Dr. Patel use one as well. So we are, it is a moving target as information unfolds, our guidelines may change, but I think I'm one of those uh, very strong advocates of only going by published data and not by personal clinical experience because I am in constant tussle with my own batchmates and my own virology colleagues uh, the world over and saying, but okay, you saw in one patient, but what does it mean unless we have uh, placebo controlled studies? So really it is a moving target and we wait for more information to come out in published data. Well, at the end of it, hopefully we will not be blind men with the elephant. Thank you very much. Uh, these are some of my references and I'm very happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nishi, for an eye-opener presentation. And I think we all have become more learned, learned in the uh, understanding the virus and understanding a lot of things which we were looking forward to learn in today's presentation. I would like to take uh, uh, questions now. I'll start with Dr. Patel. Uh, the first question is from Dr. Devinder. Uh, Dr. Patel, uh, do you give one hourly different medicine or same medicine? See, it's uh, in the order what I have written in my slides, I give in that order. So what is first? First is the mind, fear, then pneumonia, and at the last, uh, the thrombostic part. And if the pneumonia is more, then we repeat that same medicine three times. Other can be repeated only once in a day. So you know the pattern of nine, ten remedies. The remedies which are required more, suppose if the pneumonia is fine, then Prania or antim tart is repeated three times. Veratrum viridi, only single dose suffices. Whereas ferrum fos, you require three doses. So you have to plan according to the uh, case. If it is a milder one, no more repetitions are required. Moderate one, definitely. What is the pathology that is prominent at the surface? That particular medicines need to be repeated two or three times. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Devinder, second part of the question is, uh, do you use in pills form or dilution form? See, this is a very good question and it has baffled me earlier also. Ideally speaking, Dr. Hanneman formed the pills when he was already having alcohol solution as a tincture. What, what was the need to uh, develop these pill forms for him? Then I was uh, I was questioning myself, going to the literature and seeing. And finally, I say, okay, this particular alcohol is a vehicle, so it has to transfer to the uh, carbon particle of the uh, lactose sugar. So why that is needed? Because once you put directly uh, alcohol on your tongue, it benumbs your tongue. 
or if you dilute in the water it may have some action but the best action is with the pills because it dissolves on the tongue it uh, liberates the uh, saliva makes it uh, more thinner and the absorption rate improves and that must be the thing i am not uh, very certain about it but it is what from my biochemistry and other things what i learn i have drawn an inference this must be a cause and it was always a question mark why to use pills bypass the pills directly uh, tincture form but i have seen the results better with the pill forms than with the uh, tincture form directly mixed in the water or there is some people they directly put on the tongue that is all the more because it you know putting a uh, alcohol on your tongue it pinums your tongue so the sensations are lost and uh, the trans mode of transmission is not very clear with the nano particles either they uh, stimulate the nerve endings and it reaches brain or it goes into the blood that is a uh, another discovery after homeopathy is needed for the homeopathic science thank you uh, doctor this is a question from me yeah thank you uh, why why hypersulfin 1m and other medicines in 200 like right. as we have always been discussing in pathology the prescription has to be lower potencies but i see your prescriptions are going higher in pathology can you please put some light on that yes yes a very good question you asked me why i have selected one f c other carbovage i am not giving 200 30 veratrum viridi 200 peramphos 30 bryonia 200 and timtart 200 because there the pathology needs repetition and more uh, higher dynamics to be corrected now coming to what your question is hypersulf 1a you know we have read in uh, hypersulf uh, materia medica the lower potencies they stimulate or the process of uh, pus formation so from that i have said ki if i give lower potency of hypersulf and already there is a disease in the lungs and if the pus formation that is uh, more of the debris are there it starts so i don't want the pus formation i want to arrest otherwise such patients will go into lung abscess from my clinical ex from the allopathic part so uh, i selected 1m because in the cases where i have given 30 or 200 i have seen problems so i immediately realized why this is happening so raised to 1m so 1m what does it does not allow the pus formation it absorbs it uh, absorbs uh, the uh, inflammatory debris faster rather than enhancing the pus formation thank you exactly uh, experience of myself and my group also in lower potency hypersulf promotes suppuration in higher potency it uh, uh, removes suppuration yeah right, right thank you right. thank you doctor those were two important questions for you now dr nishi you have a question from uh, dr vanita uh, she is asking what are your views on the present trend of checking antibodies after sinopharm and taking pfizer uh, so to answer the first part of the question uh, sinopharm just for those of you practicing in india is a wholesale inactivated vaccine and it is shown uh, the trials were done in the uae and we had about 15000 actually total of 30000 participants 15 in dubai and the others in the other emirates where the efficacy of the vaccine has been published to be about 79.8% so uh, this business of checking antibodies i am not in favor of that at all because none of the virology or immunology associations in the world have come out with a number that gives you the protective level so i said it briefly in my antibody presentation as well that there is no level so i am constantly bombarded with questions that i did the antibody test and i am 5 and my husband is 15 and my maid is 50 so it becomes like a um, i think a ego hassle that how is it that my maid has more antibodies than i do because really if you have zero converted that's fine and most people are zero converting because it is 99.9% people because it you're giving a product people will zero convert but if i don't know the level of by after which it is protective then why am i doing the test because any test has to give you a clinical answer 
So I am not in favor. And just to keep get uh, the record straight here, I myself took two doses of Sinopharm and I have not tested my antibody test because I know that why should I do it when I'm telling others not to do it? Uh, the second part of the question was that should I take a Pfizer after Sinopharm? Well, there is no contraindication because it has been proven very well in published data that heterologous prime boosting, that means using two different antigens by, from two different sources actually boosts your immune response. And as virologists, I think our track record of success with polio has proven to the world that if we give oral polio vaccine to prevent active infection, and then followed it, follow it with an in, uh, intramuscular polio vaccine or injectable polio vaccine, the, the results have been extremely good to the point that we have eliminated polio from the world except for two countries. So it's actually two or three, I'm not sure, but it is always Pakistan, Afghanistan, and uh, uh, Nigeria, which are the culprits. So even from India, we managed to do it with OPV alone. So heterologous prime boosting is a very important concept in immunology. So if you're taking two different vaccines, it's only going to help you. And because none of them have the live virus in them, there are not going to be any issues with either of the preparations that you may choose. I think uh, the next question was from Dr. Anju that uh, her daughter is traveling to US and they are not accepting her vaccination already given, Covaxin, and they want to uh, again give her Pfizer two doses. So she was worried, is it okay or not? So I think you have already answered that. And uh, this is precisely the reason why I included the slide from Covaxin, because they have so much published data helping us. And yet the CDC and NIH and WHO has not approved Covaxin, which is, I think it's all political, but I'm not here to comment on that. But yes, it's a good vaccine, but problem is now children going to US for the start of the academic year. And there are many such cases in uh, UAE as well, where they will have to take Pfizer. So please go ahead uh, and give the Pfizer shots to your children. Dr. Faizila is asking, uh, giving vaccination in an allergic rhinitis patient, is, uh, is it going to create any issue in allergy patients as such if we give vaccination? Yeah, see, this was a great, uh, what should I say, risk in the beginning because we did not have the experience with 2.35 billion doses. Now, like 15 or six months down the line after vaccination was started in the world, lot of people have been given the vaccine and there have been no adverse reactions, except for the one where you're using an inactivated vaccine and the beta propiolactone is used in the lab to inactivate the virus. So if you have a specific allergy, this is the same chemical that is used in the fluid of, uh, you know, when you clear the bowels of for colonoscopy or various other preparations in the X-ray contrast studies. So if you have a known allergy to that chemical, that is the only contraindication that has been given out in published data. So please go ahead and give the vaccine. And of course, we are taking care that 30 minutes after the vaccine, all recipients are made to sit and then their blood pressure is measured. So any um, chances of immediate anaphylaxis are taken care of in vaccination centers. Doctor, this is a question from me. Yeah, please. What go. is your view on uh, 2DG, the medicine 2DG developed by our DRDO along with the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology? Uh, again, Dr. Deepak, I haven't seen a published article on that, so I will reserve my comment. However, the scientific premise seems good from whatever I've read and I've tried to read. But I'm still waiting for a, a peer-reviewed journal article from the manufacturers because we really have to sit down as professionals and assess the, or literally find with a fine-tooth comb, look at the scientific data and then give our uh, views. But yes, the scientific premise looks very good. Thank you, doctor. I had, uh, I wanted to speak something from my own side, but I will pass that because of the time factor. I must uh, congratulate the uh, homeopathy Middle East, especially the hard work of Dr. Santosh Kumar, Dr. Ihab, Dr. Vanita Sahani, and Dr. Ritu Vanchanda and their whole team. 
in organizing such a wonderful webinar. It was very educative, and I'm sure everyone attending today is taking home a lot of renewed knowledge. Both the speakers today, Dr. Jaswan Patil and Dr. Nishi Singh, are excellent orators and teachers. So on behalf of all of us attending today, I thank them for having spared their precious and busy time to share a part of their vast knowledge on the subject. I'll pass it on to Dr. Santosh now, uh, or Dr. Iha, uh, to carry forward. Uh, just a moment, uh, Dr. Deepak. I think we'll just see if time permits. We have a lot of questions still pending, which were there in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Vinita, uh, Dr. Santosh, do you think we can continue with question answer session or we should wind up because there are a lot of questions which are still pending? If there are a few, let's finish them. Just take three, four, five of take three, four of them. Let's continue for yeah. five minutes, and then we can next time. Doctor Deepak, uh, I think I've shared few yeah. questions with you uh, uh, on, the, on the WhatsApp. Yes, and there are a couple more after that also. You just see which are the relevant ones, and you can keep asking uh, maybe four or five questions from that. Right, right. Because I did not see other questions. Thank you for uh, bringing it to my knowledge. Yeah. So this question is uh, from Livia to Doctor Jaswan Patil sir. Kindly guide for COVID-19 vaccination homeopathic management, one, pre-vaccine, second, post-vaccine, and third, side effects of the vaccine. Uh, Dr. Livia, thank you for asking this question, because I myself had one question for Dr. Nishi. She is such a good virologist and immense means knowledge. With all the language she has spoken, spoken is almost a jargon for the physicians who are not gone deep into the immunology and virology. You know, this is the um, it's a uh, answer as well as question to Dr. Nishi Singh, who is uh, competent enough and she has done a lot of work. She has given a nice presentation, would answer at the end of my uh, questions answers. Basically, I am seeing. <clears throat> It's my observation as a clinician. I'm not very sure, but since you, Dr. Nish Singh, you're working into virology, uh, it means I, I, I am of opinion if 100 people used to get COVID disease, uh, COVID infection, out of 100, 70 would get well on their own because you know you very well said that they are the potent transmitters. But 30 out of 100, they are the people who get into the COVID disease. Out of that 30, uh, majority are mild to moderate, but 10% are going into the severe COVID disease. And out of that, 40-50% uh, patients are dying. I think it might be a more number. I'm seeing the same ratio here in vaccination, that 100 people are vaccinated, 70 are not getting any problem, but the 30% are getting into the problems of vaccination. And I'm keeping a close watch, whether it is a vaccination or whether it is that person's immunity, which is low causing a problem. And most of the time, then uh, when the people are going into a, uh, that, out of 30, 10 people are going into the severe disease. I have see, seen that they have taken two shots of the vaccination. And it was said that they will not develop the serious disease. And there were my colleagues, my some of the distant relatives, my friends, I said, you go ahead and I saw that they are going into a disease, corona disease and COVID disease into a severe stage of pneumonia and dying. We have lost them. So it was a big question as compared to the patient, number of patients I am seeing. And in that, out of 100, I am seeing problem in 30 patients. And so, for example, in one family, 10 were vaccinated. Four people got a problem, out of which one was very serious and oxygen was dropping but luckily, the question which I have to answer, the homeopathy was given and she was saved. So here again comes the role that people are getting frightened and therefore in India, many doctors also and many patients are also not going for vaccination. And therefore, there is, a, there is one, another fear is that these are the immediate reaction. What about the DNA damage that is happening, long-term effects and seeing the uh, influenza virus vaccine has shown to be a big failure. Now, use the immunity. Then there is a, 
uh, uh, in, uh, there are a lot of questions by other doctors who are saying. So from that, you know, it was a perplexing thing for me whether to tell the patient get vaccinated or not. We cannot say he don't get vaccinated. So what I started doing is a answer of question put to me that I was putting uh, into uh, three parts. Before vaccination, I used to do some studies. Uh, whether you are having an uh, IG total levels, if they are high, then you are pro uh, you. These people are going to face problems of vaccinations. Then, if eosinophils are high in CBC, then these are patients with a history of uh, allergy. These patients are going to face problems more. So, uh, immediately post vaccination, in uh, one or two, or two patients, as a study I did, and all, in both of them I found that. If they are taking co-vaccin, the dimer is started rising. One of my close uh, associate in the um, big uh, hospital at that time, he said, "If you say I will take," so I said, "Wait, let me see and let me give." And finally, the other people in the hospital say, "You have to take." And uh, then after that, uh, you know, the first shot he was fine with some fever, and the second shot he developed infarct, a very minor infarct in the brain. They say it is not COVID related, but I had I was speculating, and I kept on telling him, "Do dimer, let me check." But he said nothing happens. I am fine, fine. Finally, now that episode happened about 20 days back, and today I got a message in the morning that he again developed a big infarct, and now there is uh, some uh, uh, hemorrhage also, and he requires a burhol. So now. So many cases that I am seeing has put me a question in my mind. Ki what is happening? God knows there are uh, the deaths that are happening, complications are happening. They have been labeled that these are not related to uh, vaccine. But are they related or not? The study needs to be done because we need to know the, we are giving it, but what is exactly happening at ground level and what is being reported. Sudden death happened in one of the patients. And uh, I said, do you do the uh, RT-PCR of the dead body? Because it is the patient had expired very recently. And when we did that, it came positive. It was post-vaccination. So even there are some questions like the doctor Nish is being bombarded with that uh, people are getting COVID. I'm also looking to that. So what I do uh, now, instead of uh, uh, remaining in the perplexed situation, the moment they take uh, the vaccination, the first thing I give Belladonna 30. Belladonna 30 when given, <clears throat> the post-inflammatory uh, uh, vaccination causes the inflammatory cytokines to come. That gets under control or they, they will not go excessive. Second is uh, if it is a live virus vaccine has been given, where we are seeing the chances of getting infection, uh, COVID coming up in the flared up situation, their arsenic help 200 is working. And uh, to take care of the uh, post-vaccination problems after vaccination, Thuja 30 works wonders. And if I keep a watch, D-dimer also on all the patients who are vaccinated and CRP of the patients. And if their CRP is rising, then, and if the patient starts coughing, immediately start bryonia. So as per the cases and whatever the symptoms are coming, treat, but first is start with Belladonna, end with Thuja. And uh, fever comes and it is not getting control. Usually gets control with Rustox, Apis, or Arsenic Alba. So that is what is my approach. Uh, I'm experiencing, I'm getting good results out of that. And you can also try test and then share your knowledge with everyone so that others also get uh, benefits out of it. Dr. Patil, the, 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 the number of questions you've asked in your one minute talk, I will need 30 minutes to answer the, all the questions in detail to your satisfaction. I but know. I don't think we have uh, 30 minutes to share all the studies that I may want to. I will just answer the important ones. One of the reasons I uh, shared the pictures of the spike protein was because it is the spike protein and the immune response to the viral proteins that determines the severity of illness. Now, if you go back and realize that even the vaccines only contain in majority of cases, uh, the spike protein. 
there is no live coronavirus in any vaccine. So that would be ideal if we could do that. Even the subunit vaccines are only using the S protein. Now it is the individual's genetic MHC1 and class. Uh, that one. That saying, whose house is this? Whose house is this? I'm thinking. Then I think my, my own house, my own. Uh, could you please mute yourself, all of you? It becomes it a lot of disturbance otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, it please continue. Yeah. It is the individual genetic makeup that responds, that determines the immune response to any antigen. So whether it's coming through the vaccine or coming through the live infection, the immune response is determined by just the bottom line is your class one and class two. That's why some patients have absolutely no issues. I won't say patients because that's general uh, public that is getting the vaccine. Now, what has happened in uh, this pandemic situation is that there has been a very uh, exaggerated or very fast forwarded rollout of the vaccine in the population. It's only because these were all emergency use authorizations. So the general population studies had to be cut short to 15, 20, 30,000 people and the vaccines were rolled out. Now, as the genetic makeup, one of the reasons I myself did not take Pfizer, even though it was offered to me as priority as a physician in the UAE was, that I was very wary of using the messenger DNA, RNA technology, because prior to use in this vaccine, it has only been used for terminal cancer patients where specific tumor, uh, tumor antigens were used and the RNA was used. So I have very serious reservations even now about using a messenger RNA vaccine, because even though the manufacturers claim that the and because I'm in a professional group, I'm going to say all this. Please do not quote me on this. Uh, remember, there are 800 million plus carriers of hepatitis B in the population. Maybe a similar number of hepatitis C, if not more, because hepatitis C population studies are not done. Uh, there are known 10 of, uh, I think, 40 million carriers of HIV in the population. Remember, uh, especially hepatitis B and HIV, have reverse transcriptase, uh, an enzyme that can reverse transcribe RNA into DNA, and this is to answer your question, and can get incorporated in the genome. Now, my reservation for Pfizer was that, that yes, you're claiming, but have we looked at the prof population profile as regards to presence of known retroviruses and reverse transcriptase carrying viruses in the population. Uh, having said that, there are also a lot of dominant, uh, uh, latent, not dominant, latent viruses, retroviruses, which form a part of our junk DNA. Now, how many of them carry the reverse transcriptase genes? Nobody knows at this point. So as virologists, we have these big question marks that what happens to this mRNA when it is injected into populations and we will, you know, we'll have to take a step back and wait for another many months before, and not many people can do these studies because you really need very detailed genetic setups. So I don't want to uh, put anyone off vaccination. That's why I played the safe uh, route of just projecting and saying vaccination is helping us in containing this pandemic. And at this point in time, we have to go forward and take whatever is available. In fact, when people say, oh, but I, should I take this or that? I used to say, look, at this point in time, just take whatever is available. Let's get over this pandemic. And then we have no choice, really, at this point in time. That's why even with those thromboembolic and antiplatelet activating factor four antibodies, following activation, following AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca still is the most widely used vaccine. So what is the future? The future is live attenuated vaccines, something like oral polio, which will help us, but that takes years of study because to give live vaccine in a population is a very big decision. And no public health authority will take that, uh, that decision. And do we even need a live attenuated vaccines? Well, the answer is no, 
That is my own opinion, because there are so many circulating coronaviruses that cause respiratory illnesses. And some of the people who may be immune or who don't get anything, maybe it is the cross-reacting antibodies that are protecting them. So the clinical spectrum that you talked about, 70% going asymptomatic, actually it's about 80% if you include the mild people, then moderate and then severe. The case fertility is not 30 to 50%. I need to correct you. I think the case fertility is less than 1% at this point in time in the second wave. Because you're working in a high risk, uh, you know, ICU kind of facility, you're seeing more because by the time the patients reach you, are they're already in uh, moderate to severe uh, spectrum. But overall, the case fertility is less than 1%. Also, please, influenza vaccine has worked very well. We have years of experience. Um, the, the, in the recipients above 65 years of age, the number of patients dying because of severe pneumonia and other complications of the influenza has been substantially reduced. So please, let's not, uh, I think the uptake of influenza vaccine in India is very, very minimal. I don't know the figures offhand, but in the Western world and in the Middle East also where flu shots are given every year, the mortality on 60 plus is substantially reduced. So we are really looking at high-risk groups. It is not a vaccine for general people. I hope I've answered Thank you. Thank the, you. Big, answered the big points. Good. And uh, like I said, we can go no, in this. answered uh, very well. And, uh, and uh, the doubts that has been cleared. Here in India, we are using Covishield more, which is a live attenuated vaccine. It's not live attenuated, doctor. The It's the non-replicating adenovirus, which is carrying the spike protein. So this adenovirus has been tested for years in the laboratories and animal studies and human studies because it is a non-replicating adenovirus. So And it's completely non-pathogenic. Unless somebody can react. Remember, adenovirus is a DNA virus. So they don't mutate so easily, unlike the RNA virus. So as far as corona is concerned, it's only the spike protein that has been uh, inserted into this vector. So it is just a carrier nothing else. Thank you so much. Dr. Nishi, I have a question from Dr. Santosh. Taking two different medicine, uh, vaccines, not one, like first dose of, let us say, Covaxin and second dose of Covishield instead of Covaxin. Is it okay? Will it work uh, as good? Well, theoretically, it will definitely work because like I said, this is what is called heterologous prime boosting. So you're using two different vaccine delivery modes. You're using one as a, you know, a messenger RNA or a express surface protein, while in Covaxin or a Sinopharm, you're using a whole cell inactivated vaccine. So yes, they will work because basically you're just giving an antigenic stimulation. So 100% it will work. And Dr. Vanita has a query. Uh, Dr. Deepak, uh, Dr. Deepak yeah. I think we will wind up the session because we are short of time now. So okay. uh, probably whatever questions are left, the doctors can email to the speakers directly if they can share their email or they can email to me. I have already sh shared my email address and WhatsApp number. So we, you know, they can do it. Any further questions also can be entertained later. So I think we can just pass it on uh, to Dr. Dr. Uh, yeah, for the vote of uh, thanks please, for this. Please give the vote of thanks. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Ihab, uh, can you please take over? Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. My voice is clear? Yes, doctor. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks to our great speakers. Today's session is full of knowledge. It's full of information simply and really is amazing. And it's a, a great learning experience with Dr. Patil and Dr. Singh. Dr. Patil reminds us the importance, the importance of connect the pathophysiological of disease to homeopathy. This is very important in connecting the pathophysiological of the disease and pick up the medicine in case of acute cases. This is, is very uh, important. And a part of that, whereas Dr. Singh 
remind us the importance of understanding the behaviors of the virus of the second and the third waves, and also during cytokine storm, and also remind us the various diagnostic methods and connected to treatment. So on behalf of Middle East Homeopath, I would like to convey my sincere thanks to Dr. Batil and Dr. Singh for wonderful presentation. And we wish to have more informa informative session in the future. And also I would like to thank all participants, apart from UE, also the participants from Qatar, from Bahrain, from Oman, include Miskat and Salala, from India, from Saudi Arabia, from Kuwait, from various countries. We also would like to thank our lovely moderator, the senior most homebats of from Oman, Dr. Deepak Sharma. We also grateful to organizer who work very hard, tireless, taking the time out and try to overcome all difficulties and all problems in order to make this event success. And also, we would like to congrats Dr. Zuper. Dr. Shirileka and Dr. Nito for obtaining the golden visa. This is, it shows the importance of homeopaths. This is shows the importance of homeopathic medicine in UE. In reality, we should thank the authority. We should thank the ruler. We should thank the government of UE of considering the importance of homeopathic medicine in UE. As we know, homeopathic along with other school of complementary medicine, like Ayurvedic medicine and Uranian medicine and other in UE considered as a specialty and it's gaining a lot of acceptance by the public and authorized people. Therefore, we should continue keep learning and updating ourselves with the latest knowledge and information. So our vision as the Middle East homeopaths to continue medical education, to elevate and the standard of homeopathy and homeopathic medicine to provide our patient with the best and most comprehensive care service, and also to conduct various presentations to the public across the region of the Middle East and transfer this beautiful science to all the community in the Middle East. And also we request the participant from the participant to be part of these webinars as a speaker for the future seasons. And thanks, thanks to all of you and best wishes. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you, Dr. Hap, uh, for the lovely vote of thanks. I would just like to add a special thanks to Madam Amina and Dr. Kamil for being part of our session today. They were there throughout the session and uh, have been a great support to us always. And of course, Dr. Uh, Nishi and Dr. Patel, I think you've added uh, real flavors to the webinar by your talks, and we look forward to many more sessions with you all. Uh, and special thanks to doctors from Bahrain, Qatar, and Oman, who have been part of the journey uh, today. Thank you so much. Just few announcements that I would like to make is, our next webinar will be on 14th of July, Wednesday. So we will let you know the topics. Uh, so whosoever is interested and we look forward to other doctors participation as well from Middle East because our purpose is to promote in homeopathy in Middle East. So we need more participation from Middle East doctors for our webinars in future. And of course, uh, we are very happy with the overwhelming response from uh, all the doctors who have joined today to support us in our journey. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Mohammed, uh, Dr. Kamil. I think he's thanking us on the chat group. Sorry, we had to intervene in between when he was talking, but uh, thanks a lot again. And thank you for all the messages in the chat box. If any questions remain unanswered, please email to us. And Dr. Uh, Patil, I would request you to please send us the link. I will share that with our UAE homeopaths for them to register to part of your yeah, I have to association. On the... that, yes, please. We would look forward to that link. Oh.
they everybody I'll, wants to be part of that yeah i have put it on the chat box also and it's already there it on okay. the app also okay so everybody can please go through the link those who want to be part of that and i will also send it across in ua homeopaths in case anybody wants to be part of that thank you dr nishi for sparing your time and dr patel also i think we wind up the session yes bye yeah thank you all okay. thank you all all right okay bye bye